What it do, homies? We back here with some more of that electrician. This time we are about to learn about Percy Hobo Her Hobart. Percy Hobo, try saying that five times. Uh, and he's a tank genius of World War II. Let's go ahead and shut up and turn it up. Yo, I just wanted to know how the tanks made it onto the beaches at D-Day. And what I found instead is one of the greatest anti-hero stories of all time. And it rewrote my understanding of history. You know what? The way that he uncovers these stories is absolutely fantastic, right? And I imagine we probably would uncover a lot of history or maybe even mysteries or un unsung stories of either heroes or villains of war because there's a lot going on uh, and it's the reason why i latched on to that uh swedish metal band cap called sabaton they make songs about less uh popular war or uh, war hero uh stories very interesting stuff and i think that's the reason why i've taken a liking uh, to the fact electrician is because both he and sabaton dish out history in a way that's just so lovable if you will whether it be song or narration, right? And as a person who didn't really care much about history, I would want both of them to be my history teacher. I might, I might have came out of that a history buff, honestly. <laughs> uh, but I think it does well to increase your general knowledge as well. So, all right, here we go. Today we're talking about the man that quite literally wrote the book on armored warfare, a World War I veteran that was forced into early retirement because his fellow officers didn't like him very much. But after on, before we get into this. Y'all think his uh his ad will be a uh, war? What is it called? World of Tanks, War of Tanks, right? I do some reactions uh, to video game content and War World of Tanks, something like that. Maybe I'm I'm, I'm gonna guess that right now. Your German tanks rampaged through France and North Africa, utilizing their new Blitzkrieg tactic. Winston Churchill himself would call upon this man to leave retirement and go toe to toe with the infamous German tank commanders Erwin Rommel and Heinz Guderian. Ladies and gentlemen, the hero of D-Day that you've probably never heard of, Major General Sir Percy Cleghorn Stanley Hobart, AKA Hobo. But first, a word from our sponsor. This video is brought to you by Delete Me. Oh, Delete Me is an wrong. online subscription service. It's a very straightforward, simple business. You give them money, they get rid of your personal information off the internet. Okay, look, here's the deal. Somehow, some way, your personal information is on the internet. Your name, your spouse's name, your parents' name, your address, your last five hmm. addresses, your phone numbers, and all of your emails are all sitting in some data broker's bank and they're selling that information for money. But the good news is that these data brokers are legally required to delete your information if you submit an opt-out request. And that's where Delete Me comes in. They will go to all the- you know, crazy is that you have to submit an opt-out request right i have to do that otherwise i'm i'm pretty sure there's probably some fancy writing somewhere that says look man you agreed to this man when you when you decided to get internet you agreed to it you know some some type of stuff that that's overlooked a lot but that's crazy that i have to opt out hey hey yeah don't do that like it's personal information but hey <laughs> I feel like services like this is even more important in this day and age, bro. My channel, uh, my first channel got hacked. I lost that one. I regained, I lost it and regained it, but I didn't trust it. And then this channel has been hacked twice. So I got it locked down now, but come on now big data brokers and automatically submit opt-out requests on your behalf and you don't have to do anything. And I know what you're thinking because I thought the same thing. I don't want to give all my personal information to delete me either because that just seems counterproductive. Okay, here's the thing with that. You don't have to give them all your private information. You can literally give them your name and your email address. You can give them more information if you want, but really all they need is your name and email. And then you come back a few days later and they just start asking you a bunch of yes or no questions. By using just your name and email, they'll search through all the data banks and figure out who you are and they'll ask you a bunch of weird questions like is this your dad is this your mom is that a relative is this your address did you used to live here did you grow up at this address is this your phone number is this your email they know all of this information just by you giving them your name and email using all the information that these data brokers have and then you just let well, i guess the email kind of uh uh separates you right because my name is david smith you know the most common name in a known universe outside of like john or william or bill right what's another one let them know, yes, that's me, and then they will delete all that information for you. Uh, a couple Tom. days after that, they're going to send you a report. Here was mine. Over 70 data brokers had my information, and there were 489 listings where that information was for sale, and Delete Me submitted opt-out requests for all of them. Now, those data brokers are probably going to be able to get my information again, but Delete Me is constantly going to be searching for my info and automatically submitting the requests as soon as those listings pop up. Probably Go check out happen. Delete Me. I'll have a link and a discount code down below. Let's get back to the video. Percy Hobart was born in India in 1885. 
1905 and joined the British military in 1902. He would then go on to fight in World War I. While there, in typical anti-hero fashion, he made a name for himself as being extremely effective, but unorthodox and disobedient at the same time. Because of this, many of the other British officers don't really care for him. Despite that, he makes it through World War I, ends up earning himself a military cross, and then in 1919, he goes off to college. Greg you know, I find that the people who of often do the most or, or are the best are the people who do things in an unorthodox way, right? Um, like like geniuses, right? They have a certain maybe quirk or something to themselves that 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 makes them do the way they do. But yeah, generally, if you I think if you kind of think about all the geniuses and stuff, regardless of the field that we that that they might be uh, in, you would find that they had some type of weird quirk about them, right? Juan ends up earning himself a military cross, and then in 1919, he goes off to college. Graduates from college four years later in 1923, he then volunteers to be an officer in the Royal Tank Corps. Now, he volunteered because most people did not want this position. And that's because at this point in time, a lot of the high-ranking British officers didn't see the true potential that tanks and armored vehicles had. They simply viewed them as a single tool for trench warfare to get from one trench to the other. They didn't realize that one day it was going to replace cavalry. Percy Hobart, on the other hand, was a visionary and saw its true potential and that's why he volunteered. Not only that, he was also very vocal about this opinion and he would actually persuade a lot of the younger soldiers to believe the same thing, which honestly isn't a very hard sell. The new guy joins the army and you're like, hey, quick question, did you want to ride a horse into battle or did you want to drive a fucking tank? Okay, everybody's picking a tank. And I mean, honestly, if you, I mean, you pose it like that, you would think about, hey, flesh and bone, steel, <laughs> steel. You know what? I'd be interested to know you guys can um, let us down. Uh, why was, let me do this. Why was that the popular belief? Just get from one trench to another trench, right? Maybe it's just in, the inability to let go of old habits, right? Because, you know, they've been using horses in wars for long decades, decades, you know, long, long time. So it's just a popular, hey, I'm going to ride a horse. Why would I want to ride in that? Uh, also, I, I can guess like lack of understanding, right? Things that you don't truly understand, you tend to stay away from, even if there's a lot of benefits, right? What are the benefits? I mean, not what are the benefits, but what are the benefits to you if you don't, you know, if you don't, you don't understand it. So, hmm. Over time, his advocacy for change ends up making a lot of the old cavalry officers end up hating him because he's kind of trying to make them obsolete. And you have to remember, at this point in time, the British officer corps is very, very clicky, like they're socialites and gentlemen, and they have to, you know, conduct themselves in a certain manner and all that BS. So when Hobart comes in and starts ruffling feathers, it upsets the entire officer corps, and they all pretty much hate him at this point. Despite that, he knows he's right, and he just keeps working on pioneering new tactics and new applications for tanks. Now, one of the few legitimate concerns about having tanks on the battlefield at this point in time was that they were basically autonomous. And what I mean by that is once the tank crew got their orders, hopped in the tank and took off, that was it because tanks didn't have radios and stuff yet at this point in time. So once they left, you couldn't call them back. You couldn't change up the mission. They couldn't communicate with anybody outside of that tank. So Hobart comes out and he's like, well, hey, rather than not using tanks because they can't communicate, how about we just, I don't know, put some radios inside of them. So he fights tooth and nail for like a year to make that happen, gets radios put in all of his tanks and then trains his guys how to run battle drills, being able to actually communicate with each other and the chain of command. And guess what? It works exactly how you would expect it to. I mean, yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, it, it wasn't, I mean, obviously he's, you know, he's paraphrasing. He makes things, uh, the fat electrician, you know, he kind of boils it down to, to you know, or, you know, a basic level of understanding. Uh, but him just making that suggestion, right? Uh, Percy just saying, hey, I don't just throw radios in it. I refuse to believe that he was the first person to think of that. Why did nobody else think of that? Like, oh, yeah, we can't communicate. Why don't we just put radios in it? The first thing that I'm thinking is maybe political stuff, right? How things got to go down the chain or something like that. I'm drifting off, but these questions as it's going to my head, because, you know, you just think you'd be like, there's a problem, S solve it. Unless uh, it could be that their funding, right? This is a war was going elsewhere. And they didn't really see any benefit to that. That could be, that could be a reason. Okay, with each other and the chain of command. And guess what? It works exactly how you would expect it to. I mean, this is the upside down ketchup bottle of the tank world. Like somebody finally came out with this idea and everybody's like, how? How did I not come up? with that right, billion dollar right. idea. At this point, all the junior officers and lower enlisted are like, holy shit, this is awesome. And all the older, more experienced officers that already hated Hobart lose their shit because he's now actively making them look stupid. What <laughs> are those you are wearing? Classic movie. Is <laughs> 
So once that gets worked out, he starts developing legitimate oh, battle man. strategies and drills and training his men on how to conduct tank warfare, how to integrate tanks with infantry, really laying the groundwork for what would become modern tank warfare. This goes on for a couple of years, and then in 1927, he ends up being a co-respondent in a divorce case. Now, I'll be honest, I had to Google what that meant, but apparently co-respondent is the fancy British officer polite way of saying Percy Hobart was banging somebody else's wife. Her name was Dorothea Field, and of course, she was another British officer's wife. Naughty, naughty. After that divorce is finalized, Dorothea and Percy get married pretty much immediately, and the rest of the officer corps now absolutely hates him, and they actively try to get him kicked out of the military because this is not gentlemanly behavior. They're not able to get it done. Hobart stays in the- Oh boy. Oh boy, fast forward. I mean, I- Oh boy. <laughs> kicked out of the military because this is not gentlemanly behavior. They're not able to get it done. Hobart stays in the military and continues to develop and refine armored warfare. And one of the things he starts to do is look back into history and see if there's any lessons that he can apply to tank warfare. And one of the things that he hones in on is the Mongols. The Mongols were so successful because they utilized cavalry to strike deep into enemy territory at strategic points, weakening their entire empire. And Hobart says, what if I could do the same thing, but with tanks? And to anybody that knows a lot about history, that sounds an awful lot like the German Blitzkrieg tactic, and that's because it is. Strike hard, Yeah, strike the Germans fast. didn't come up with the Blitzkrieg. Percy Hobart did. Heinz Gedermann, the German tank commander that is the architect of the Blitzkrieg, is well known to have had every single paper that Percy Hobart published translated into German, and he kept that with him everywhere he went. Yeah, the infamous German tank commanders Rommel and Gedermann didn't revolutionize armored warfare. They just copied Hobart's homework. So if Percy Hobart is the actual genius behind the Blitzkrieg, why don't most people know that? Why does everybody give Germany credit? That kind of reminds me of uh, Rome, uh, Rome, right? Right, they were known, well not known, but their military was known for uh, really, really advanced tactics and everything. And I'm, I'm not too sure, but I would think that there was, you know, civilizations that discovered some of their work, started implementing their attacks. Right, their attack patterns, their attack strategies, and everything, because their strategies was was was, was mind blowing. Right, they were able to topple um, like big groups of people with just small uh, with small groups of people uh, and just strategically attacking. Right, on some some Sun Tzu type stuff. And why didn't the British use it first? Or at the very least, know that it was a possibility when it was used against them in France when they got their asses beat in six weeks. That is because the British chain of command hated the man that came up with the Blitzkrieg and for that reason made the entire strategy a failure. In 1934, Britain conducted a large training exercise where Percy Hobart was gonna be allowed to try out his new methods. If you don't know, when you're conducting a large military training exercise, you have like team A, team B, and then you have the umpires, so to speak. You have the people making sure that both teams are doing the right things, saying, yeah, that works, no, that doesn't work, declaring who wins and who loses. The umpires conspired against Hobart because they were military officers and they didn't like him and basically made his entire strategy fail. Fast forward 1937, Hobart is given command of the 1st Armored Division, Great Britain's first modern tank division. Because of this, a bunch of British officers promptly throw a bitch fit and try to get Hobart kicked out of the military again. It fails again, but the chain of command has to come up with a compromise, and that compromise is to take Hobart and send him down to Egypt where he can take command of the second armored division, which was basically, we're gonna ship him halfway across the world and then pretend he doesn't exist. <laughs> out of sight, out of mind, right? So Hobart gets down to Egypt and it is a complete shit show because tanks are effectively replacing Calvary. I use that same effect when I need to split my kids up. They be getting mad at each other. I just put them both in one, put them both in rooms, leave them to their own devices. After a couple of hours, they just come back together and be like, oh yeah, I forgot what we was even fighting about. How you doing? <laughs> a tactic uh, as old as time. So Hobart gets Very down to effective. Egypt and it is a complete shit show because tanks are effectively replacing cavalry at this point. So it's cavalry officers that are running tank divisions and they have chosen to not read any of the literature or training material that he has spent the last Blind decade the developing dark. and they are operating tanks like they are dragoons. If you don't know, a dragoon is kind of like cavalry, except it's, it's not. They ride in on horses and then they dismount and go into battle on foot. And that's what the second armored division is being trained to do. They roll up in the tank and then the gunner and the loader stay in the tank while the rest of the crew gets out and fights like infantry while being a static target instead of a moving target, which is the entire point of being a fucking tank. The chain of command is effectively trying to do everything they can to make tanks look bad and ineffective because by extension, it makes oh, Hobart look bad yeah. and ineffective. Wow, that's, that's, that's extremely petty, especially when we talk 
talking about war, right? Lives. Wow. That kind of gives you like a sense of just, just how easily they were just discarding lives and everything. It's like, oh, I, that's, that's kind of petty. The running joke when Hobart gets there is that the Egyptian force is the Egyptian farce and the mobile division is the immobile division. But when Hobart shows up, he turns the entire thing around. Between 1930 and 1940, he trains this entire division how to actually conduct tank warfare and they get super effective at it. And the men absolutely love him. Because Percy Hobart is not only a great teacher, but he actually wants every man under his command to understand what they are doing and why they are doing it. When at this point in time, many Many other officers don't care about that. They just want you to shut up and follow orders. But Percy Hobart wants you to know what you should be doing and why you should be doing it. That way, if the chain of command ever fails, you can make intelligent decisions regarding what needs to be done. In short, Percy Hobart Great treats leadership. his men like they're grown ass men and they absolutely love him for it. And because of that, he gains overwhelming support from the junior officers and enlisted men and he becomes immensely popular. No don't like that. And because of this, they finally force him out Saber. of the military because they sent him down to Africa, intentionally sabotaged him. And yet again, he's managed to turn the entire situation around and turns it into a positive thing. So they just end up getting him fired. In 1940, he is forced into early retirement. Wow. On his final departure from Egypt, the men of the second armored division you know, line is doing really, really good work, right? He's enlisting the moral support of his under of his underlings. Things are going great and you just eject them. It's almost like you don't, I'm missing something. I just can't, I can't get over that. Forced into early retirement. On his final departure from Egypt, the men of the second armor division lined the entire road to wish him farewell as their sign of how much they actually respected this man. So Percy goes back home, but still wanting to be involved in the military, he joins the Home Guard, which is like the British equivalent of the National Guard. And he gets busted down from Lieutenant General to Corporal, which if you don't know military ranks is like wow. going from CEO Level to two. front desk receptionist. Not that I'm trying to talk bad about receptionists, but I'm trying to give you an accurate depiction of what a drastic change in authority this is. Five months after Hobart's forced into retirement, the German military rolls into France with tanks, utilizing the Blitzkrieg tactic that Percy Hobart designed and completely stomps the British and the French army in a matter of six weeks. Erwin Rommel then goes and proceeds to rampage through fast. North Africa, and the only people that even kind of slow him down are Hobart's men of the 2nd Armored Division that is now known as the 7th Armored Division, aka the Desert Rats. At this point, Winston Churchill starts asking questions and realizes what his officer corps is done and he personally calls Percy Hobart back into service and awards him the rank of major general there at which go. point all of the officers throw a fit yet again saying <laughs> that he's 57 years old he's too old to serve in the military and they try to get a med boarded out Winston Churchill yet again intervenes and stops the med board and issues this statement quote the high commands of the army are not a club it is my duty to make sure exceptionally able men, even though not popular with their military contemporaries, are not prevented from giving their services to the crown. Translation, quit being a bunch of catty bitches. We need this guy. By the time all that political BS gets right. done, Rommel is back Petty. in Europe and he has been tasked with fortifying the Atlantic Wall, the German defense from Norway to Spain in case the Allies should invade. Rommel reinforces it with 260,000 men manning over 15,000 concrete bunkers and artillery. 260,000. For some reason, when he said that, my mind read 26, just 26,000. I said, no, wait, there's an extra digit there. Hillary positions. The entire thing is coated with barbed wire. It has anti-vehicle emplacements to prevent tanks and other vehicles from getting up the beach and they lay over 200 million mines. And the man put in charge of figuring out how to penetrate those defenses is none other than Percy Hobart. He has re-entered the picture and he knows that these kids have been stealing his homework. He comes in with the complete dad energy of, I taught you everything you know, but I didn't teach you everything I know. He takes command of the 79th Tank Regiment and gets to work immediately. It is now Major General Hobart and Erwin Rommel awesome going toe-to-toe -to -toe in a battle of wits that will determine the fate of the world. And obviously we're gonna handle this issue with tanks, which brings us to problem number one. One, how are we going to get tanks on the beach? How are we going to get a 70,000 pound hunk of metal with a gun from the boat through the water 
onto the beach. Obviously, we just gotta make a tank float and it can't be that hard because battleships float, right? I mean, those are big and heavy and made out of metal, so why can't we do the same thing with the tank? All you have to do is displace enough water and bada bing, bada boom, you're floating. So all we gotta do is increase the surface Easy. area of a tank. So they take a gigantic tube of wax canvas, wrap it around the tank, and then have inflatable tubes that when they inflate it, the canvas stands straight up and basically it is a tank inside of a giant canvas tube. And then we'll just add a couple of little boat propellers on the back of the tank so it'll push itself through the water. Problem solved. Sounds stupid, works terrific. So now that we've got the Sherman duplex drive amphibious tank figured out, the next problem, what is the beach made out of? Are the tanks gonna get hung up and stuck? Cause we can't have that happening either. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a submarine. We're gonna send them out. They're gonna wait till night. Once night falls, the sailors are gonna go ashore, gather up a bunch of the dirt from the beach and figure out what it's made out of. It's made out of blue clay, probably the worst possible thing because those tanks will for sure get stuck in clay. So There's obviously problem mechanisms. number two, how on earth are we gonna get the tanks through all this blue clay? It would be really nice if we had a road. You know what, fuck it, we're just gonna bring our own road. Ladies and gentlemen, the bobbin. That is a Churchill tank with a gigantic spool of canvas that has metal rods inside of it. No, nah, man, this is, this is crazy. This, the inventions that came out of necessity, those are generally the best ones, right? Instead of the inventions that people make, they kind of just line their own pockets without, without like the interest of, of, of who you're selling it to. In this case, it's not selling and everything. This is of course, you know, just, just problem solving, but the, the innovation is brilliant like what can you imagine people just uh he he's in there cooking up something and then you got the chattering you're the you, you're in the military and then it's like bro they figured it out how do we can do it and then you just see a tank rolling up like this like if i was the enemy i wouldn't even know what i was looking at and then you see it happening and you're like bro we 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 might die because i mean i might just go out there and be like hey bro that 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 is <laughs> That vision is crazy, bro. Hey, let me join your team, bro. Because I don't know what we're doing over here. <laughs> it literally goes ahead first and That's lays amazing. down a road for all the other tanks to drive on right up the beach. Again, it looks really silly, but it works super well. At this point, all the other people that hate Hobart are starting to make fun of them. They're starting to refer to these tanks as Hobart's funnies, but they have no idea how oh. important these tanks are gonna end up being. Hobart is over here actually trying to save the world by any means necessary. He realizes it doesn't matter how cool it looks, he just needs it to work, and just he needs only needs it to work once. Meanwhile, all of his other contemporaries are worried about looking good while they do it. Okay, problem number three, marching right up the beach. Now we have to worry about the mines and the barbed wire. We can't be blowing the tracks off our tanks with mines. We need to clear the barbed wire for the men, and we don't want the barbed wire getting hung up in the tracks of the tank. What are we gonna do? Things are about to go from looking weird and silly to looking terrifying and awesome because the plan for this is to eat the barbed wire and blow up the mines in front of us using the Sherman Crab, AKA the flail tank. Okay, so just so we're on the same page, in theory, we have now figured out how to sail a fucking tank a mile through the ocean, build a road in front of us as we drive it up the beach, cut through barbed wire and detonate mines. The only defensive structure left is the enormous concrete bunkers with Germans inside shooting machine guns and mortars. What are we gonna do about them? Because normal tank guns aren't gonna take those out effectively. Which is a pretty simple solution. If your gun isn't big enough, just get a bigger gun. Ladies and gentlemen, the Petard. It is essentially a mortar that is the size of a propane tank, affectionately dubbed the Flying Dust Bin. You call that big? Yeah, the thing's huge. That explains a lot. What is that supposed to mean? You told me eight inches. And you told me you took installments. I didn't know what that meant. That's your problem. Interrupting my history time. And it's the flying day. Hey, hey. Yeah, them conversations be happening sometimes. As married man of nine years. Sometimes, man, it's... it's <laughs> that was some true love right there. That's what that was. Installments. I didn't know what that meant. That's your problem. Interrupting my history time. And it's the flying <laughs> dustbin doesn't work. This one will. The most terrifying of all of the creations the crocodile, AKA the flamethrower tank, pulling a armored trailer with 500 gallons of jungle jelly capable of shooting flames over 250 yards. So if everything- oh 250 yards, 200 flames. I didn't even know that was possible. All I, I, I mean, I. I'm not like a flamethrower specialist, but I've seen flamethrowers before and not even get that. 200, bro turned into a Charizard. They turned their tanks into a Charizard. 
fire dr dragons, dragon breathing tanks. Gallons of jungle jelly capable of shooting flames over 250 yards. So if everything goes according to plan so far, the enemy is either going to be dead or retreating. Here's the problem. Once the enemy starts retreating, they're also going to start blowing up all the bridges behind them, making it very hard to maneuver vehicles, especially tanks, across ravines, rivers, ditches, and so on. So what are we going to do once they blow up the bridges? Fuck it. I guess we'll just bring a bridge from home, right? All right. So here's what I'm thinking. Now, obviously, as they're making these advancements to the tanks, they must be, uh, I'm, I'm guessing they didn't just think about this all at once and enroll an ultimate version tank, an omnipotent tank out, right? They must have gone through a couple of battles, realized what didn't work, and went back to the drawing board, right? Uh, don't tell me that they made all of these. I mean, obviously, they have knowledge uh, from what their failures were from people on horses, and they probably had previous tank battles before Percy got there. So it's possible that they had all this information prior, and they knew how to build the tank before they started pushing out into the war. But if you're going to tell me that they made all those advancements, right, and then just sailed the tank on through, and you ain't got no answer for it, that's that's crazy. That this must have years of research had to have been on lots so, lots of failures right right oh what are we gonna do once they blow up the bridges fuck it i guess we'll just bring a bridge from home right no i'm not messing with you ladies and gentlemen bridge tank <laughs> oh man it went from this is kind of silly and there's no way that's gonna work to oh my god that's terrifying to okay now you guys are just showing off and i know what you're thinking that's great but what if it's just a little tiny anti-tank ditch or a ravine not something that really necessitates an entire bridge well that's easy ladies and gentlemen the fascine aka a bundle of sticks so that's it. The plan is set. Hobart has accounted for absolutely everything. Oh, and this okay. plan is for sure going to work. But here's the thing. You've probably seen a bunch of movies or played a bunch of video games that incorporate the Fury. landing in Normandy on D-Day, and you've never seen any of this stuff. That was Fury, right? That's what that story was about. Amazing soundtrack. I've, mm, such a good movie. I might go watch it again. Stuff. So... Why is that? That's because most movies and video games like Saving Private Ryan, for example, take place on Omaha Beach, which was one of the American beaches, and the Americans didn't have access to all of Hobart's tanks. Why is that? Well, some people believe that the American leadership saw it and said that it was stupid, not going to work, and they didn't want anything to do with them. However, that's a myth and it's completely untrue. Omar Bradley saw Hobart's inventions and requested all of them. Unfortunately, not enough could be made in time, and the only thing the American forces would be Dang. given for D-Day was the Sherman the DD yeah. duplex drive amphibious tanks. And the reason that Hollywood focuses on Omaha Beach is because it's the most dramatic. It's the one beach of the five where absolutely everything went wrong. And believe it or not, one of the main things that went wrong was that the Sherman duplex drive tanks didn't make it. They got released too far off the beach, and the seas were too rough and a lot of them ended up sinking. Luckily, Dang. only five tankers drowned. The rest were able to escape and get picked back up by the boats. But it was a huge issue not having tanks on Omaha Beach, and it is part of the reason that Omaha was the deadliest beach on D-Day. If you pay attention and you know what you're looking for, it's even referenced in the Saving Private Ryan movie. No armor has been in the shore. We got no DD tanks on the beach. Dog one is not open. So just so we're all on the same page, the reason most people have never seen or heard about these things is because they weren't at Omaha Beach and Hollywood focuses on Omaha Beach because it was the deadliest, most brutal battle. But the reason that it was the deadliest battle it's was quite literally in part due to the fact that Hobart's funnies weren't there to help the Allies fight. These tanks are quite literally a victim of their own success. To give you an mm. example of how big of an impact they had on the other beaches, the next deadliest beach after Omaha is Juno, and it had less than half the casualties. But Hobart and the 79th Armored Division's contributions aren't done on D-Day. At this point, Hobart decides rather than keeping all of his men together as one unit, like pretty much every other type of armored unit did, he decided that he was going to split them up and attach them and their specialty tanks to all unit, the other bro. units of the Allied forces, essentially turning his tank division into the special forces of tanks. Need to clear some mines? Here's the crab. You need to scare some Germans? Here's the crocodile. By the end of World War II, the Germans were so scared of the crocodile flamethrower tank that they would start to surrender at the mere sight of it. The 79th Armored Division and Hobart's you. Funnies fought all. all the way through the European theater, and when they finally came up to Germany, the first Allied forces to cross the Rhine into Germany did it in Hobart's duplex drive Sherman tanks. Because Hobart's Funnies and the 79th Armored Regiment were spread out amongst all the other units in the European theater, every time a unit did something special, credit was given to that unit, and the contributions by Hobart, 
Hobart's men and the Hobart funnies would go unnoticed and unrecognized. Wow. So in conclusion, this was wow. the story of Major General Percy Hobart, the man that pioneered modern tank warfare, the man that trained the men that beat Rommel in North Africa, the actual inventor of the Blitzkrieg tactic, and one of the most important architects of D-Day and the Allied advance through Europe. In the pages of history, he is a victim of his own success because everywhere he wasn't was such a catastrophic shit show that it monopolized the spotlight, and everywhere he was, things went so smooth that it wasn't worth reporting, so yeah. he went unnoticed. Wow. When people think so of tank warfare in World War II, way too many people think of Erwin Rommel and Heinz Guderian, when in reality, they should be thinking of Percy Hobart, and I hope this video helps with that thanks for watching best way to support the channel is go buy some merch thank you know what? quack bang out and you know what not only that but um um oh, man, i was sitting there thinking uh the enemies right they have intel so you know they do enough scouting they can figure out where he's at and decide to attack the place that has the least resources which i guess is just kind of just battle one-on-one -on -one. but wow see look at that now, next time I'm watching something and I see something like that, I'm be like, hey, bro, that's Percy. Let me tell you something about it. Then I can be like the, the, the egghead of the family. <laughs> Anyways, that's the end of this video. Dave's out.